Uh, let's make a start. Uh, my name is Andre Tomlin. I'm the Mental Elf. Um, for those of you who've never heard of the Mental Elf, we are the world's leading elf themed mental health research blog. It's a big claim, I know. Um, and we're really delighted to be uh, involved in this webinar today, which is trying to talk about priorities for youth mental health research. I'm here with my colleague, Laura, who is going to be live tweeting the event today. And if you want to get involved in that, the hashtag for the event is Young People MHQ. Do you want to post that into the chat, Laura, so people can copy and paste if they need to? Do introduce yourselves in the chat here in Zoom. Say hello. Tell us who you are. Tell us where you're from. Uh, and we've got a poll to start off with. Alice, do you want to put that up on the screen for people? This is really just to find out who you guys are and what your primary roles are in relation to this event. So tell us, are you a person with lived experience? Are you a researcher? Are you a clinician? What sort of people have we got here in the webinar? So this event is um, a National Institute for Health Research event, and we've got staff here from NIHR. We've also got people representing a really wide number of mental health research funders. Uh, and the event is going to be broken down into two halves. The first half is going to be a series of short talks that we're going to have uh, from experts in the field. And we're going to also then have a panel discussion where we're going to ask mental health research funders to talk about the youth mental health landscape and to reflect on some of the questions that have come up um, over the last few years in the research prioritization work that's been done that's being presented today. So it looks like over half of our audience are mental health researchers uh, and we've got a mix of all sorts of other professionals, quite a few research funders, people from charities and health professionals and a few others as well. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much for, for filling that in everyone. So this event is going to be recorded uh, the slides and videos will be made available afterwards. Um, we're not recording any of the chat, so feel free to say anything that you want in there. Um, but anything that is said by the speakers here um, will obviously be part of that recording. Uh, and you guys in the webinar are not being recorded. There's no audio video of you. You're just joining via chat, so you can watch it um, and do what you want. We won't see it. We won't hear it. Um, and join in via the chat. So yeah, do say hello in there. Okay, so I'm going to start by introducing our first speaker. Um, we're really delighted to have Professor Dane till -Wikes here today, particularly as uh, Till is not officially working today. She's joining us from her holiday destination. So thank you, Till, very much. Um, I'm sure you all know um, she's Professor and Vice Dean of the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. And her talk today is going to last for 20 minutes and it's entitled Mental Health Research, Why, How and What Should We Study? Over to you, Till. Okay, thanks a lot for inviting me. I'm, uh, I'm currently in Wales and I have promised uh, my family both my parents and my children that we're off to a castle this afternoon so I will be leaving as soon as I've given the talk um, otherwise there'll be knocks on the door um, of this spare room so I'm going to talk a bit a bit about how why and what should we study just as an introduction and uh, of course I need to uh, I seem not to be able to move my screen oh I can move my screen uh, but I should just say that I have these various um, uh, uh, method, uh, sort of uh, things to say about what I, my background is and grants and stuff. Um, but I wanted to start really with talking about how you set um, a, any research priorities. And particularly, there's going to be an emphasis on this, uh, because governments often set the priorities for us. And governments are affected usually by the economic cost. So how much does it cost us? And for instance, the EMBO report uh, a few years ago talked about how mental disorders are not just accounting for a lot of economic costs now. Uh, in fact, more than some diseases like cancer or diabetes, 
but they will increase exponentially over the next 15 years. And of course, <clears throat> that was before we had a pandemic. So we know that mental health problems have uh, sort of risen to the top of public view. So we need to think about that. But it's also when you tell fin the finance um, ministers that it costs 16.3 trillion worldwide, we know that that will get their attention and they will think more about mental health research. And in fact, this is one uh, from last year from, the from Australia. And the Australian government looked at basic information, including how much they spend on mental health, how many people have it, and the cost to the economy. And they included things like, you know, how much does mental ill health cost in terms of lost education or a lack of engagement in education, which is clearly important for this particular seminar. And they designed their, what they're going to do in the future on the basis of uh, the, the generally the costs. But you also need to tell them that they're gonna get something back from uh, doing research. Now, there is, there is evidence that for both cardiovascular disease and mental health research, you get a return on your investment. And in fact, for every one pound that we invest, we get 37p back. That means after three years, you're in profit. You're actually making uh, money each year after that. So it's important to show a balance when you're presenting information to um, policy makers. So they are all good reasons, but does it actually affect investment? This is a study looking at research funding expenditure and the disability associated to, with mental health disorders. And if you look in every single one, you'll see that except for Finland, all of the other areas spend much less than the disability. So in France, Spain, and the UK, they spend a lot less. And in fact, in a study that I did um, uh, with David Kingdon, we actually showed that over three years, there was no difference in the way, even though it had been highlighted in one year, three years later, there was still the same underinvestment in, in mental health research funding. This is a study uh, this year, and I really wanted, it's a, a study about worldwide investment in mental health. And I just wanted to highlight these areas, which are of most interest to people attending this seminar. So anxiety disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders, eating disorder and conduct disorder, and self-harm are all likely to be areas of interest to you. And as you can see, even worldwide, there isn't a lot of spending in those areas. And if you look at the costs in particular areas of the translational research spectrum, you will see that these areas, so prevention, detection, and development of treatments are still much less than uh, etiology or underpinning research. And etiology is probably of interest. So it is an area where there's a lot more investment um, and that's probably important when I come to the very end of the talk, when you'll see what you, what I think you should be spending money on. So I want to tell you about Roma. It was a three year project funded by the EU on developing a roadmap for um, research in Europe. We had very specific reasons for doing this. So it was looking at public, public health interventions and treatments and services. And public health was there to reduce the burdens on society, so the indirect costs. And the effective treatments and services was there to reduce treatment costs, the direct healthcare costs. Again, you can see that costs keep on coming into this equation for thinking about uh, mental, mental health investment. But we also in this looked at European level competitiveness. So we wanted to know what we could do in Europe that probably couldn't be done anywhere else. So what we did was we looked at more than 28,000 papers. We mapped research across Europe. 
we identified those gaps in knowledge. And importantly, we contacted a thousand uh, people or organizations. And so it's probably much more than a thousand people. Uh, but the most important part was that we involved service users, their families and organizations. And many of the previous uh, ways of setting up priorities had not actually done that. So we, we, we actually got to the priorities and I'm just showing you this because it's a complex thing. We had work packages, six of them that actually produced 150 priorities. We integrated them and produced 20. And then we ended up with six high level ones. Now the high level ones uh, were then sent out, well, the integrated priorities were sent out for prioritizing in a survey, but we actually gave more weight to those that were that where key stakeholders had identified them. And interestingly, of course, the top 10 were virtually the same, just in a slightly different order. But we gave the service users um, and carer groups much more um, weight. I wanted to tell you how we integrated it. You don't need to read this. We got all of the priorities, which were very long. We reduced them once, and then we reduced them twice to get information like this, research into prevention and resilience. We published it as seven pages in the, um, in the Lancet Psychiatry, but you can, of course, look at the 194 pages without any of the appendices on the Roma website. What I wanted to point out is that it's actually quite um, a hard and long process to produce this. And um, I must admit that I feel I could definitely produce world peace now because trying to manage all of those uh, different views was quite a challenge. Uh, but so this is the one that I think that you would be most interested in. So it's research into mental disorder, uh, prevention, promotion and interventions in children, adolescents and young, in young adults. And obviously, I'm talking to uh, an audience that knows this, that mental disorders do affect children and young people worldwide. They're definitely underrepresented in the current service provision. And again, this is money issue again, it's good value investment. So it reduces health and costs in other sectors. And we know this because uh, Martin Knapp and Dave McDade did some work on this. If you, if you invest one euro, you get 10 euros back from early screening. You get nearly 18 euros back from prevention and a whopping nearly 84 euros back from a one euro investment for mental health promotion. So it's a really good return on investment. So that was Roma, and I'll come back to it in a minute. But in the service use involvement is important. And I know NIHR um, certainly uh, suggests that and has supported it for many years. There are these other things which I'm not going to talk much about because I know Thomas is going to mention it, where uh, service users are involved. And there is quite a few of these now. So there's one in schizophrenia. There was one produced by MQ and depression. There's the one that Thomas is going to talk about and children and young people. And there's now a digital technology one that's also been produced. So they, these are the ways I think that most highlight service user involvement. But in order to prioritize anything, what I think we need is we need the funders involved. If they don't feel they're involved, they're not going to spend the money. We need academic researchers involved because academics do know what is in the pipeline, what has been found and what is potentially feasible in terms of research. We need to involve healthcare professionals because they're the ones that will be in receipt of the outcomes of research. So the questions that are asked need to be ones that they understand and they highlight. We probably need to in involve some professional bodies because they might need to think about how they adapt their way of managing their training to make sure that these things are also highlighted. We need charities and foundations because they're advocates 
for the uh, for the end result and also maybe funding some of the uh, services. And the most important, of course, is we need service users and carers because they're, they will tell us the right sorts of questions to ask. And you can do it in lots of ways. And in fact, I've used all of the ways except in uh, citizens juries. And I know that some of the ways that NIHR has produced things has been using these methods. But we really need to make an impact. It's not just about producing the, them. And the way that Roma did it was we had a press launch and we got things all across Europe because you need to get it into the public sphere Individuals with mental health problems need to know that there is the potential for things getting better via research. So do their carers, so do health services. So you need to advocate for it all the time. We also advocated to the EU and we did get um, some investment in e-mental health and personalized medicine and got mental health added to the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases. We got it put into the five year forward view, which was really lucky because it came out as we were producing Roma. And there was a recommendation to produce a 10 year strategy for mental health. That strategy was produced by the Department of Health. Roma had an impact on both the MRC and the MQ's manifesto. Uh, so you need to have an impact, but what about making a real impact? So. We've had an impact of the priorities on funding, but what we want to know is where it's going to, where this research is actually going to make a real impact. And I think that's about putting it into goals. We need a limited number. They need to be accepted by everybody. They need to be measurable. We need to have targets to complete a goal. And we need to, because we measure them, we know that when we need to adapt those targets, because when we have evidence available, we don't need to keep on reinventing the wheel. We should move the money to other things which will actually support the future. So Peter Jones, Kathy Creswell and I, plus an enormous band of other people uh, got together because Chris Whitty decided that we should. And uh, this is a process coordinated by Chris but involved health service providers, research funders, charities, service user groups, and individuals, both academics and service users. And we produced these four separate um, research goals. The obvious one for you is the first one, which is research to halve the number of children and young people experiencing persistent mental health problems. And under that one, we've got targets. So one of them was about development and progression of mental health problems. One is about promotion, prevention, treatment and support. And the final one is about implementation of effective interventions. So we need to measure, and the reason we need to measure, these are a bit like sustainability goals. You know, you want to raise awareness of them every 5, 10, 20 years. So if you measure where you've got to, you will be able to remind people. So in terms of uh, reminding people that we have data, so we know, for instance, that from ONS in 2018, that one in eight of all 5 to 19 year olds have a mental disorder. And in, from NHS Digital last year during the pandemic, that increased to one in six, although slightly lower age grouping, which is a worry. This is not just because of the pandemic, because the numbers were already going up. Two years before 2018, it was one in nine. So the numbers have been, there's been a trajectory of increasing. So we can measure these issues to know whether we can implement the research into treatment services. So I wanted to look at the research questions you have, and you could put them everywhere, but your very first one is what are the critical components of effective school-based interventions? And that absolutely clearly fits with target B. And you've got others which you can put into the other targets for that, for this particular goal. But there are four goals. And the fourth one was about improving choice. 
And you've got question four out of your top 10 and others which actually fit into that category, including the one on large scale rollout of treatments. So you've actually got quite a lot of information that can fit into here. But I wanted to point out some things which I think every uh, you have to be wary of when you're doing these. And I know they're not in your probably not in your top 10. But you have this one, which is about accessing, uh, which was number 16 in a list I had before, maybe not in not number 16 now. The problem with that one is it's an ONS issue. We do not need to do academic research. We collect these data. We can work out whether what these uh, age, gender, family, poverty, region, and ethnicity are in relation to treatment and support. So it's not a research question we need to answer. We know we can answer that through LNS. How do we improve access? This is a really, I think this is one of your top 10. The problem is that if you ask any clinician, they will say, well, we could improve access if we had more services and more clinicians who can provide them. So that is really a policy issue. Once there's enough people to provide the evidence-based treatments we already have, then maybe it becomes more of an issue about implementation and access. This one was an interesting one because I just thought, why would it be a research question? It's an overarching method. I would expect participation in co-design to be used for every research project, not just for this one. And the last one that I spotted was about promoting protective mental health. The other one was preventing pre uh, mental health, which I think is just a repeat question. So the way that we would have done it in Roma is we would have looked at how we could have amalgamated some of those particular questions. OK, so there has been investment. This is a good thing. So. Uh, only last week, actually, uh, June 29th, they, there was an announcement of 24 million and they've gone into a lot of studies, which some of which, particularly, for instance, strengthening adolescent resilience um, and some of the digital health, which may be about rollout, uh, those ones will be answering some of the questions that you have. And the um, NIHR infrastructure, uh, grant which was I think came out yesterday um, actually mentions the research goals as well as does uh, I think it's uh, research for patient benefit in the northwest so people are taking note of the goals and I think it's quite important to think what is the impact of this research not just what is the next question to answer that may be a priority so in order to develop them um, goals, you need to have them accepted by all stakeholders. We need to highlight them and invited talks are things which all of the researchers could look at. And I think for research funders, you need to hassle them with data about why these are particularly important. You need, everybody needs to get involved where the money is and particularly with policymakers. So I've come to the end. I wanted to thank these people, well, everybody on this slide, but these people in particular, um, uh, Josef Maria Harrow, who work, I worked with, who's in Barcelona, and the two young researchers who, you know, without them, we would have been tearing our hair out with this process. But I also wanted to thank all of the people who were the authors of the Mental Health Goals paper, um, including service users, people from uh, the uh, charities some, and some people from funders who also wrote a lot of commentaries about the papers and uh, whether they were worth it. And we did also invite, I should let you know, we invited some critical comments by service users, particularly because we failed to include issues to do with um, ethnicity and particularly Black Lives Matter and the stigma in, in um, our report. But finally, I wanted to thank this person because without him, I would never, this took, I can't tell you how long it took, probably three years 
in total. And it was stopped and started. And without Chris, I would never have continued with it. I would certainly, I thought I was ready for this, but actually it's a really hard task to do. Okay, I wanted to thank everybody. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Till. That's great. Really fantastic scene setting for us for the event today. Um, I just, in the time we've got you for maybe two or three more minutes, I just wanted to kind of follow up with you on that question about um, equity and making sure that we involve the right people in research. Um, and it feels like that's a cross cutting theme in the way that you're kind of doing the information science, you know, making sure that we are um, doing research with people from all different communities, um, making sure that they're involved in co-production of that research, making sure that we're trying to answer questions that are relevant to the lives of everyone in our society. Um, I guess my question is, if that's a cross-cutting theme, this, this point of equity, rather than a specific research question, are we in danger of those people being missed? Because currently our research is very white, it's done on white people by white researchers. Um, yeah, just your reflections on that. Um, well, I was certainly taken to task by our one commentator about this particular issue. I think, I don't think this is a hard thing to do, actually. I think it's easy. Uh, it's just that we, you, in order, you have to gain the trust of those communities. And the problem is that it takes time to get that trust. And you just have to put a lot of, in terms of being a researcher, you have to, it's worth having some support perhaps from you know, a patient um, and carer, but I say patient because that's what the group has decided to call itself, but service user and carers groups and, and with those organizations that uh, represent them, including their advocates. So you do need to work really hard to get their trust. And I know I've lost people's trust, it takes two minutes to lose people's trust. It takes a year to gain it and probably another year and a half to gain it back once you've lost it. So it's about listening and being reasonably um, upfront about what the uh, potential is for doing some things. So you need to, you need to explain things in a way that everybody understands, but you also need to be uh, make people aware of what you can't do as well as what you can do. And I think that's, that's an issue. Often researchers feel that they're giving up power when they involve all these groups, but actually the most intellectually stimulating and the best research I've done is when I've listened hard to people about the questions that I've been asking and have changed the, those questions because what I was asking was the wrong question. Um, and you know, I, I mean, it was, you know, an obvious thing. You talk to people, they ask you questions about where is this research leading and you realize there's a massive gap and that actually you should be asking a different question with a different outcome um, because that's really, I think that's really important. Um, I do think for, you know, we have surfaced the minorities issue and we need to think very hard about that. That is quite a tough one uh, to overcome because of the lack of trust. I just think we need to work just much harder at it. Thank you. I know that's the topic that we're going to come back to later on in the discussion, but we wish you well with your family trip this afternoon. Hope you enjoy the Welsh hills, all the, the castles that you're going to go and see. Uh, and yeah, thanks very much for joining us again. Okay, well, I'll go and try and entertain my family uh, over the next afternoon and hope it doesn't rain, which of course it always does on UK holidays. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Okay, bye. Thanks. Okay, so uh, yes, our thanks to Till and um, thanks to Vanessa, who's point posted a link there in the chat to the Centre for Mental Health report that's been published today on research inequalities, very relevant to the conversations that we're gonna have, I'm sure. Um, so our next speaker today is Ian Newington. 
uh, and Ian is the Head of Special Projects at the NIHR Central Commissioning Facility and Ian is going to give us a very quick five minute introduction to this project. Thanks very much Ian, over to you. If you're talking... Yeah, if, it take, if I take my mute off, it will, hopefully you can see my slides. Um, so um, just as a very int a brief introduction, because because largely the reason you're here is is probably my fault as much as anything. So um, and I wanted to tell you very briefly in a, few, in a couple of minutes, uh, if I can get my slides to move on. Yeah. Uh, so what special, what, why is it a special project? Or what is a special project? What we, tried, what we decided about three years ago was that um, NIHR wasn't actually very good at ca catalyzing uh, added value from the mass of people that we fund and the range of things that we do. We didn't bring, we, there was lots of disparate parts of NIHR and we didn't bring them together as well as we might do. So we tried to, to start running a few projects to catalyze some of that happening. This was one of those. It's taken rather right. So it's a bit like crowdsourcing really to try and solve uh, solve problems. Um, this was one of those projects and it, the, I'll just give you a very, very brief picture of the timeline. Back in February 2018, uh, the I4I uh, Challenge Award uh, was around mental health. We had a, we had a winner takes all competition, which is slightly unusual. Uh, the award was actually made to Daniel Freeman uh, at Oxford, which has subsequently become Oxford VR. Um, and but at that meeting, we were at the science, uh, the, um, the Lord of Shaughnessy came and presented the prize and so on. Um, and it was it was at the MQ science meeting. And at that meeting, two or three of us were there and we listened to some really interesting talks from the researchers around what was happening in, ter in terms of children's mental health and some of the research and underpinning things that they were starting to find. And it was very clear that there was things happening earlier than perhaps we originally thought. And it twigged with us that we should perhaps think about doing something as part of our project, because we were thinking about doing something in the mental health space already. Um, so that's really where it started. And then um, we started looking to see who our researchers were. Um, and um, in June, Vanessa came to um, the, the CCF offices in Twickenham, and I had a chance to have a chat with her. And we was, I was mentioned that we were looking at doing something in this space. And she said, oh, you must come to our JLA uh, workshop. So I came to the JLA workshop final session in uh, July of 2018 and walked away with a, a draft list of highly secret priorities. Um, and then we started put, working together to put the project together. And then I went to the launch um, and at the, at the launch, it was announced that NIHR were going to do something. And so we kicked off a project in, 20, in January of 2019. Um, unfortunately, 2019 went past and not a lot happened. And we, we've discovered one of the challenges with doing special projects was actually you need to get some actual bodies assigned with, with ring fence time to do something. Uh, but eventually, um, we outsourced some of the uh, practical operational side of this into a company called Oxentia based in Oxford and they uh, did a lot of work for us and in July we started so many of you who are here have probably been involved in this uh, activity we ran a survey to um, try and identify the research questions uh, we did some looks at criteria and we scored those research questions against the criteria we tried to weed them out in the meantime you're going to hear a little bit about the method methodology behind that um, from Parisa um, a little bit later um, and then um, we gone back to McPin uh, and and some of the with the top 25 of those research questions that we came out with and and, and they've been uh, looked at again by the McPin uh, young people's group uh, and that's kind of brought us to where we are today so um, clearly from what uh, Tills mentioned uh, we we didn't manage to quite weed out all the questions that weren't real research questions and and, and at least one dupl possible duplicate so we will need to have another look at that um, but you, what you're going to hear today is a little bit more about that story uh, where it started and the methodology that we've used to get to where we've got to today. Um, and uh, I probably don't need to have questions at this point. We can pick that up probably a little bit later in Q&A. Absolutely. Thanks, Ian. Um, I didn't think you would manage that in five minutes, but you have. So very, very well done. Um, and yeah, do post any questions you've got for Ian in the chat. Um, so we're talking really about five years worth of work here, um, a project which began in 2017, led by the McPin Foundation and has subsequently been picked up by uh, NIHR. And that's what we're gonna hear now over the next sort of 20 minutes or so. First of all, from Thomas Kabir, Head of Public Involvement at McPin Foundation and Catherine Fadashe, who's a, um, a young person with uh, lived experience who's um, gonna be talking about this project. Um, right people, right questions. So yeah, over to you, Thomas and Catherine, tell us what happened in 2017 and 18. 
Thank you very much, Andre. So I'm just going to set up my slides from the beginning. There you go. So uh, thank you very much for inviting us. So as Andre has just said, my name is Thomas Kabir. I'm delighted to be here. And I am head of public involvement at the Ripin Foundation. And I'll just hand over to Catherine. Um, hi, um, my name is Catherine and I'm a part of the um, Young People's Advisory Group, which deals with agency within young people whilst receiving um, mental health treatment. Right. Thank you so much, Catherine. So just a little bit about the McPin Foundation for those of you who may not be familiar with us. We are a mental health research charity. I've put up some uh, text about us. We work across the country. We very much champion lived experience. We uh, specialize in involving people with lived experience, both in conducting primary research and also as advisors to specific research projects and studies up and down the country. Um, Many of our staff are based in London, but we do have staff that are also based in other parts of the country too. And our studies, the studies that we support are literally um, all over the country. So we want to speak to you firstly today about the Right People, Right Questions project. This is something called, was something called the James Lind Alliance Priority Setting Partnership, which many of you will be familiar with. And the aim of this project was to identify the top unanswered research questions around young people's mental health. And I've just put the web link in there where you can find all the full reports, um, which I will be referring to, to today. It's www.mcpin.org forward slash RPRQ. It stands for Right People, Right Questions. We gratefully acknowledge the support of the various funders of the project, some of whom are with us, uh, with us today, and also our steering group. So I'm delighted to see Stephen Primatuk from Manchester here and Mary Rose Tarpe, who was our James Lind Alliance um, advisor throughout the project. And of course, all the young people who were involved in the project. This is a rather busy slide. I promise you, I don't intend you, I, I don't, uh, intend you to look over every single detail of this. The project started in December 2016, and myself and Vanessa and other people were actually having conversations about this well before then. And it finished roughly in November 2018 with a launch in Parliament. 2,566 people submitted over 5,500 questions. The point I want to make in this, doc, in, in this slide is the number of different steps that we had to go through. We had to come up with a scope for the project. We had to narrow the scope. We had to design a survey. We had to design a survey that was accessible for young people. And that involved giving people paper copies and uh, going out into schools and doing promotion work on social media. We had to tell people what research was. We had to hold a workshop. We had to turn the questions that people submitted into questions in something called a PICO format, which would go into a second survey. There were a number of different steps and at every single point we involved young people. I genuinely believe that we wouldn't have successfully completed the project without the involvement of young people guiding the project at every single step of the way. To facilitate young people's involvement, we had a young people's advisory group advising the project, and you can just see on the left hand side is a picture um, at the Wellcome Trust who gave, generously gave us a venue for the final workshop. You can see a picture of um, the steering group and others um, holding up cards with the final prioritised research questions on it. And I can see Mary Rose on there and I'm, I'm sort of lurking, sort of trying not to be photographed on, on the left hand side. And on the right hand side is a picture with Charles Walker MP um, when we launched the final reports in Parliament. Um, and we kept our white pad going. I'll speak a little bit more about that in a moment. How did our white pad shape the project? Well, they, how didn't they shape it? They decided on the project name and logo. They decided on the scope of the project. They were members of the steering group. They met roughly every three months. And there were also a range of benefits to the young people that got involved, I think. They gained research skills. They were involved in report writing, blog writing. They were involved in putting together the questionnaire 
and so on. And of course, they were involved in the final workshop. So they've had extensive involvement throughout the project. And as I said, I don't believe that the project would have successfully completed in any way, shape or form without them. The full report, as I say, is available on our website, www.mcpin.org. I would encourage you to have a look at our priorities. And I've just put screenshots of some of them. Um, number one was, would the screening of young people be appropriate for the early identification of mental health difficulties? And if so, what would be the best way of carrying this out? I do want to say that this isn't meant to be hierarchical. So the way that James Lynn's Alliance Project says in partnerships are meant to work is you get a kind of top 10, but it doesn't mean that question 11 or question 12 or question 13, for example, are any less important. The other thing I'd like to point out is that these are just general themes. It was always intended using this methodology, but other people would pick up these themes, turn them into more detailed research questions, involve people with lived experience and turn them into specific research proposals which would then go to funders for funding and this is part of the reason why we're here today. I just want to draw your attention to what is our question number 11. How can the number of effective culturally appropriate approaches available in children and young people's mental health services be increased particularly for ethnic minority groups? So issues around diversity and equality loomed large in our priority setting partnership and also in our workshop. And this question number 11 is intended very much to be a cross-cutting theme in all of the other questions that we have listed in our, our report from questions one down to question 25. And there's a very good quote there from uh, Wayne Reed, who was a member of our steering group, talking about the importance of involving children, young people and others from marginalized or seldom heard communities in designing culturally appropriate uh, approaches. So it really kind of gets both that diversity and equality, which I think are massively important. And we know we have lots of evidence to show that there is massive inequalities within the mental health system and without. And that in order to tackle these questions successfully, we very much need to have good involvement of people from marginalized and seldom heard communities. So what next? Well, we need research being commissioned based on all of these priorities. We need researchers and funders to work together on studies to answer the questions on our list. And this is what today is all about. So we very much kept our Young People's Advisory Group going. It's gone from strength to strength. And indeed it has been involved in other priority setting work. So on the left-hand side, you can just see a screenshot of an infographic that we produced on a project around screen time, which was commissioned by the Department of Health um, and delivered in collaboration with UCL and other partners. So we helped do a party setting partnership around uh, screen time. And of course, we gave our contribution to this project with the NIHR of taking our right people, right right people questions and then turning them into a more detailed set of research questions which could then be which could then be worked on by others to get funding. So I'll just hand over for some reflections from Catherine. Hi, so as I previous, previously mentioned, I'm part of the YPAC group that deals with agency um, within young people um, whilst receiving mental health treatment. And um, the reason why the reason why we I can be a part of these sort of um, discussions is because we can provide a perspective that clinicians can't. I think we come from more of a compassionate and empathetic um, perspective um, rather than from like a textbook. And so that's why I feel it's very important for um, funding to be given to researchers because there's so much that we don't know about mental health within young people, especially like with the advent of um, social media. Social media is still such a new thing and also COVID-19 and we don't fully understand like the, I guess the adverse effects it has on young people and so like 
I believe that's like the reason why I feel so um I feel so passionate about being part of being a lived experience advisor helping to shape these discussions and eventually like policies um I believe that researchers need to have like a targeted need to make targeted effort to reach um people who don't um, who don't usually utilize mental health services. Um, for example, someone like me who comes from, I come from an African background. So obviously um, mental health is something that's still quite stigmatized. And like when I was in not such a good place, like I attempted suicide, that was something that was very isolating for me. And because like, of the culture that I come from. It, was, it wasn't something that I felt I had the right support in getting me through that. And so like even people from like Asian backgrounds or Eastern European backgrounds, like those are still um, communities where mental health is just not something that is really look, seen as important, even religion as well. There are some religions where uh, mental health is not seen in the best light it's seen as more of like a spiritual thing as opposed to like an actual mental thing that needs to be um attacked medically so for me it's i'm very passionate about being a part of this because the difference between a young person um you know i'm someone with a lived experience there are some young people who died like they probably committed suicide i attempted suicide and so it's like it is a matter of life and death not to be dramatic it is also the difference between a young person being able to go into education or not being able to go into education or the difference between a young person being employed or not being employed, a young person being able to have a healthy, long lasting relationship or not being able to have a healthy, long lasting relationship. And so it's like, it might seem like it's not important, but it's super important because mental health is something that affects every aspect of our life. So yeah, thank you for listening. And thank you so much, Catherine, for those reflections. And I can very much identify from that. I come from a Bangladeshi uh, background where mental health is not really spoken about and is treated and is heavily stigmatized as well. So I just in the last few slides want to kind of give some thoughts and some kind of suggestions for the future. Recruiting a diverse range of young people, as Catherine has explained, to get involved in research is so important. And we're probably not involving completely the right set of people um, just at the moment. There are some groups that we are missing. Whilst the pandemic has made meeting face to face difficult and, and sometimes impossible, we would say where you can go out, go out and meet people, build trust, as Till was saying. Trust takes two seconds or two minutes to lose, but years to build. So it's important to get out and to meet people kind of face to face if we possibly can. What we do at McPin is that we try to reserve a certain number of places informally for people who have not had the opportunity to get involved in research before. And so we try not to select according to ability experience or how well people may fill out an application form. And indeed it may be better or more simple, simply to have a phone call with someone or to find another way that's accessible for them to express an interest about getting involved in research. I do want to say that virtual meetings are not always cheaper. Some people do not have computers. I feel privileged in a way, but I have several. It's no problem for me. Some people have disabilities which make virtual meetings harder for them. Some people don't have a good internet connection or any kind of internet connection at all. And it's important not to see virtual meetings as a way of doing things in a cheaper way. Due to language or other reasons, people may also find virtual meetings to be quite inaccessible. And indeed, meetings, meetings held in this way may not be for everyone. And one-to-one -one conversations or email, or indeed conversations via social media might indeed work better. So we have some requests. These are just ideas. So a request to research funders, of course, please fund user involvement in the design of the research proposals. 
it's a bit of a weak spot in the world of research funding, I think. And although there is some funding available, there's probably not enough support available currently, I would say. Please review budgets for involvement, particularly virtual involvement, particularly carefully. We have seen during the course of the pandemic in proposals that we've looked at, some pressure to kind of cut costs. It's like, oh, you don't need your travel expenses. You don't need this, you don't need that because the meeting will be held online. But we've just said there are other costs. People might need a laptop. People might need uh, uh, to have their internet co uh, costs covered and so on. Indeed, with virtual meetings, particularly with young people, there are other safeguarding concerns to think about. Please give researchers and young people time to do good involvement in funding proposals. We all understand that sometimes we just have to get things done very quickly, and there are a whole myriad of reasons why that will be. But it does take time to involve young people or any, anyone else in research. And therefore, if you want user involvement in research proposals, we need to build in time for them to be able to be involved. And please ask for a specific plan to find and involve young people from less represented backgrounds and communities. I think this very much should be uh, an ask which researchers make of people that are applying for funding. And a parallel request to researchers, please share power. I think Till alluded to this, it can be very fruitful and involve young people as co-applicants in research roles. We tried to do that at McPin. Please budget appropriately for involvement. So in studies that we've seen with extensive involvement, these can have five to 15 or above percent of its budget dedicated to involvement work. Please try to be flexible with young people. For example, holding meetings during weekends, providing alternatives to share ideas such as Slack and Basecamp. Um, those are online platforms, providing work placements. And we've seen examples where research groups up and down the country have provided wonderful work opportunities for young people. I think that's very, very much to be encouraged. And also in parallel, parallel with the request to fund us, develop a specific plan to find and involve people with, from less well-represented backgrounds and communities, and of course, follow through. And of course, a request to service users, people with lived experience, please step forward please get involved. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I put an uh, email address for myself and Rachel Temple, who was our Young People's Lead and who was instrumental in the original White People, White Questions project. And I put myself and Catherine's uh, Twitter handles just there and I'll hand over to Catherine to finish. Um, just to reiterate the points that uh, Thomas made, um, I really do hope you've taken in what we said about including a more diverse, um, including di people from diverse backgrounds into your um, research um, to give a more accurate understanding how mental health affects young people. So thank you again for listening. That's great. Thank you both for sharing. Um, thank you particularly to Catherine for sharing your own personal experience. I know how big a deal that is and it was really powerful what you what you shared with us there. So thank you for coming along. Thank you. And doing that. Thank you. Um, I, loads to ask in, in response to that presentation, but I think there are two really key recommendations that you came up with that I've really latched on in my brain. One is pay people pay people for involvement and make sure you've got that money in your budget. And the other thing is about sharing power. And I wondered if you could share a little bit more, Catherine or Thomas, on, on how you see that working in practice for the researchers that we've got, particularly here in the webinar. How do you go about doing that? Catherine, do you want to say anything or you would like me to kind of begin? You begin, please. <laughs> So a, a bit about sharing power at its most basic level is giving people, equipping people to have a voice, being listened and to make change. So being a co-applicant is a, a, a formal role in the funding application. You have formal responsibilities, but also alongside that, we have responsibilities to equip people who are co-applicants to make sure that they can fulfill their roles, that they can have their voice heard and that change is minuted and indeed made. So one is establishing roles and career pathways for young people within the research process. So at MOPIN, we've tried to, uh, we've tried really to foster a, uh, a method of having young people as co-applicants and also as co-researchers alongside other people in the research team. So giving people established paid roles 
where they're formally recognized, where they are paid, where they have the necessary contracts with universities to be able to do research and NHS trusts, of course. Um, and when they also have uh, training, that's the other part of this, they need training to do research or to get involved in research, which is a bit of a weak spot, I think, generally in the world of involvement. So training is another one in order to share power. But I think also people need, uh, need to be willing to share power. They need to be willing to see that space to young people to say, we don't have, we don't live in your shoes. We don't have the experience that you have. We don't have the experience of coming from your, the community. I don't of the community that Catherine has, for example. And of knowing that and of making space for their opinions. I'm sorry if that's a bit waffly, but those are just some ideas. Yeah, just to add on to what Thomas said, I think for me, it's like, it kind of is like turning your lemons into lemonade. So knowing that your experiences are actually valued and like other people want to um, understand. And so for me, it's like kind of like an incentive for young people to get, because it is, it is quite like a vulnerable thing to be sharing your experiences. So, you know, sometimes it's good to have that incentive. And it's also just like knowing, like feeling as Thomas um, said earlier, just like you're being heard and like your experiences are being validated and they actually count and they can potentially help somebody else not having to go through what you've gone through and just like hoping that you know in the future young people can have um the sort of mental health treatment that is effective for that for their well-being fantastic thank you both that's really great and i'm sure we're going to come back to some of those things i'm sure the funders who are going to be talking later on are going to be keen to reflect on that um so it's time to move on uh, our next speaker is parisa mansouri uh, she's the operations manager at the nihr mental health translational research collaboration you guys have all got such massive job titles um and uh, parisa is going to be talking about the chinri methodology so another uh, fantastic acronym. Tell us all about the Chinri methodology, Parisa. Uh, yeah, looking forward to this. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. So can you hear me and see my slides? Yes, you're not on full screen mode yet. So if you, perfect, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Andre, for the introduction. And it was, uh, I would have liked to, to, to continue the discussion with, with Catherine and, and Thomas because it was really um, interesting and very important, but I, I'll try to keep this short and if there will be any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take later. So I, um, um, as, as Andre mentioned, I manage um, the National Institute for Health Research, Mental Health Translational Research Collaboration. And in this specific project, I, I advise the management team about the methodology because of the research and education background I have had in health research priority setting uh, methods. Um, so I'm going to talk to you briefly about the method that we use for this prioritization, which is called the Chenry methodology. Um, if I can move to the next slide. Okay, so CHENRI stands for Child Health um, and Nutrition Research Initiative, and this is only because this was the first um, area and context that this prioritization method was used in. So CHENRI initially began under the Global Forum for Health Research in Geneva, funded by the World Bank in 1999, and the vision was to improve child health and nutrition of all children in low and middle income countries through research that informs health policy and practice. But the challenge was that the group who were uh, hoping to, to reach that vision, they realized that the then existing uh, prioritization methodologies had some limitations that kind of didn't allow them to do what they wanted to do. For instance, they wanted to ensure they, they were including researchers and um, patients and the public from all over the world, but the then existing methodologies that were mainly based on having workshops and face-to-face -face meetings were making it difficult to do so. So um, a group of people came together to see if they could develop a different methodology and they eventually um, developed it in 2007. And since then, this method called Chenry has become the most widely used health research priority setting in the uh, method in the world. 
it has now been applied to over in over 100 um, different contexts and obviously it has started in um, child health but it has been used in a wide range of um, um, health conditions dementia mental health infectious diseases even recently in COVID um, 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 context so basically it uses the principle of wisdom of the crowds wisdom of the crowds as many of you would know is saying that um, a, a diverse collection of independently deciding individuals in vast majority of cases is likely to make certain types of decisions and predictions better than any individual expert. So the whole idea is that instead of bringing like 10 or 12 um, experts to a meeting and ask them to agree on a set of um, priorities, the idea is to involve a larger group and a more diverse group of researchers and ask them to independently propose research questions which they believe are supposed to be um, the most important questions in their opinion. And then we ask those um, researchers again to, to score the collection of all those um, proposed questions, again, individually and independent from one another. So what happens is that uh, when a Chenry exercise is finished, we will have a ranked list of research questions um, that are scored against a set of criteria. Yeah. And then you can see that the strengths and weaknesses of these questions um, um, compared to one another. Sorry if it is um, all confusing. I will try to explain it better in the next slides. So um, initially, to do a chain reprioritization, you um, form a management team. And this is what we did here. Uh, we invited people from McKin um, Foundation, from the NIHR, and, and we decided on the context and the criteria to be used in this um, exercise within the management team. So the context was around what population to involve, what age range to focus on, uh, what health targets to, to look at, um, and what time frame to, to include in terms of seeing impact from the proposed research. Um, and, and then you will um, decide what researchers to invite to, to propose and score research questions. And we used uh, um, different methods to identify the leading researchers in this area in the UK. And then when all those researchers propose their, um, 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 their, their questions, then you will collect all those questions, try to remove the overlapping ones, merge the similar ones and send back the list of questions to those researchers to score. And this is the, the stage that is quite difficult to do and some of the limitations of our exercise that Till um, very nicely highlighted in the beginning was because this uh, process of um, removing the overlapping questions and merging the similar ones without losing any of the important questions is so um, difficult, but we did our best, but we acknowledge that there might have been some limitations. And then you, um, once the um, scoring is done, uh, you can involve the members of the public in various ways. And what we did was that we invited uh, um, McPin to help us with this, and they invited the, a group of their um, young advisory network and group of parents to, to help us with this stage by re-ranking um, some of the top questions. And then you will calculate the final scores and find um, the, the list of priorities. So in, in this method, everyone has a role. So it starts uh, with funders who would define the context and define the expectations, define the criteria, um, because we really want to have a criteria for scoring the questions because the outcome of health research is very uncertain. Nobody can predict what a research question is going to lead to. So we need to have a set of criteria to kind of manage this uncertainty. And then and the researchers uh, will, will propose questions and score them and the stakeholders from the wider society could be involved in various ways. So in this specific uh, project, it was decided to focus on the age range that the James Lind Alliance and prioritization had considered 11 to 25 years, and um, also um, to address the 
25 priorities that the JLA process had identified as important needs. And for the time frame, we looked at uh, questions we can impact within the next five years. And to find the leading UK researchers, of course, this is again a, a difficult process to ensure that you are including everyone that has to be invited to this process. So we looked at um, researchers from the major um, funders, the NIHR, the UKRI, MRC, MQ, uh, McPin. And, and in addition to that, we had an open invitation where anybody could register interest to be part of this project. Um, and it, uh, eventually, um, 79 people signed up to participate and out of which uh, 45 of them proposed research questions. So we collected 112 questions from across all those 45 researchers. And after removing the overlapping ones, uh, we had a list of 87 questions, which we sent back to the researchers. Eventually, 45 of them scored that list of 87 questions. And as I said, we used uh, criteria for scoring the questions, and this criteria was set by um, the funders and the charities in the beginning of the uh, process. And the criteria was um, chosen to be answerability, effectiveness, deliverability, impact on health, and equity. So each of the researchers had um, these five criteria against each of those questions, and they could uh, choose whether they thought a question was meeting these criteria or not. And based on all those scoring, we could calculate the final average score for each of the questions. And 16 members of the McPin Young Advisory Network and two of the parents from their group re-ranked the top 15 questions and also commented on the wording of the questions. Um, so I guess um, Ian can, can, sorry. You've got one minute left. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. Ian is going to share the results with you later, but I just wanted to use this opportunity to very briefly introduce you to our uh, NIH for Mental Health Translational Research Collaboration, which is a collaboration of 14 centers across um, England, Scotland, and Wales. And I just wanted to announce the good news that we have now established a new work stream in children and young people's mental health. So we are going to support um, uh, this group of researchers to work closely with, um, uh, with the members of the public, with uh, funders to, to develop um, um, research proposals that are going to address um, these identified needs. And this work stream is going to be led by Professor Helen Minnes from the University of Glasgow. And we are very delighted to have Helen today here on the call. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you, Parisa. Uh, and so now leading on from that, we've got Ian again, who's going to be presenting the research questions and the priorities that we came up with with this Shinri methodology. Over to you, Ian. I always forget that the mute changes screen when I put it onto full screen. Um, so I'm, always, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, doing this because I'm now what I'm hoping is that we can share the there's a we've done a summary document um, uh, in a in a PDF format which just lists our list as um, 87 questions against the uh, the, the JLA priorities. Um, but I, I will just give you a couple of couple of highlights um, of of what we've seen. So. Um, Uh, so right. So I just did a quick mapping of um, the, the, the JLA 25 priorities on the bottom and the number of questions that are in that 87 uh, research questions that address each of those. So uh, what, what you'll notice is that uh, I guess the, well, the top nine probably have most of the, uh, the top, certainly the top 10 have most of the uh, 87 uh, questions related to them, but there are a few that, that trickle down into some of the later questions. There's one or two questions there uh, that, that don't have any uh, research questions particularly um, so that was just that was just a quick um, overview so what the, now I'm 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 not absolutely sure whether we can do this but I I'm assuming we can do this in in the in the chat uh, and oh there is a file I think we can make a file available hopefully um, in a moment about um, uh, the uh, with a list of the questions and what we've done is we put it into um, 
a simple uh, table. Uh, this is a this is a very brief summary. We have a we have quite an extensive um, Excel spreadsheet, as you can imagine, from the methodology that uh, Parisa was just explaining, um, and it has all the different scores against and the rankings and lots of numbers and so on. That will eventually appear uh, in a publication, uh, and I'll come back to that when we look at next steps a bit later on. Um, but what I've literally done is just listed down. Uh, the the the, priority, the research questions in their order based around the scoring that we that we had uh, against the JLA priority. So what you'll notice on there, for instance, is that uh, priority number one on JLA appears uh, four times actually on the first page. Um, so, um, uh, but that just gives you an idea about which of the JLA uh, questions are addressed. Um, so that's that's basically it, and hopefully we'll be able to, we'll be sharing that with you um, as part of this uh, webinar before the end of the webinar. Um, and then there'll be a publication later. So that's probably all I really wanted to say about the um, about the questions. Okay, thanks, Ian. I'm just going to paste the. Um, it'd be nice to share these questions with people who are joining us. Um, whether we can do that as with the PDF or by post pasting them into the chat. Um, if somebody could do that, that'd be really helpful. Uh, otherwise, we're talking rather theoretically about these priorities that we've come up with. I'm sure people would love to to read through those. Um, so yeah, that will happen um, over the next few minutes, I'm sure. But now it's time to, to move on to our funders panel. Uh, and we're really lucky to have representatives today from a number of the main uh, mental health research funders. I'm gonna introduce them uh, one at a time and I'm gonna ask each of them to give us a very brief summary of the research that they're going to be funding um, in future on youth mental health and also to reflect on what they've heard and to think through what the biggest challenges are in answering these questions that have been prioritized over the next decade or so. Uh, so our first speaker is Karen Breakspear. Uh, she's head of the programme for mental health at the Medical Research Council. Uh, and so representing UKRI and the MRC at the meeting here today. Uh, so yeah, first of all, over to you, Karen, tell us what your work is currently in this area. Thanks very much. Um, so as Andrew said, I work at the Medical Research Council, which is part of UK Research and Innovation. So it's worth saying up front that UKRI funds uh, mental health research and wellbeing research very broadly. Um, so I'm only going to speak to MRC's remit and interests specifically today, but, but do bear in mind that there are other very interested um, research councils interested in funding this space. So mental health research has, has long been a key strand of, of MRC's strategy, and we do support quite a wide range of different types of mental health research, which includes uh, clinical, developmental, genetic and neuropharmacological aspects of, of mental health research. And in terms of our remit and where we sit in the landscape, we support um, fundamental discovery science in non-clinical, clinical and population settings, all the way through to development and initial testing of new treatments and preventative measures. So we've got a number of regular funding schemes that are open very regularly, which would be appropriate for research focused on youth mental health. And these include our research grants, our programme, our partnership schemes that, that sit within the Neurosciences and Mental Health Board, which I'm a part of. But there's also our fellowship schemes, our training schemes, public health intervention schemes and our translational research programmes, which very much focus on, on driving innovation and, and speeding up the best ideas into new interventions and, and, and dovetail quite nicely with, with the remit of NIHR as well. Um, in 2017, as, as Till alluded to, um, MRC published its strategy for lifelong mental health research. Um, and it was very much linked within the, the Roma ambitions and, and the um, Department for Health and Social Care's framework for mental health. And so a priority within that was very much a focus on, on the impact of early life and adolescence on lifelong mental health. And as part of that, a part, sorry, as part of that, we've, we have partnered with the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Economic and Social Research Council. And we've recently been able to um, successfully um, apply and, and been awarded funding from UKRI um, to focus on adolescence, mental health and the developing mind. And that's a large 35 million pound initiative. And we've recently awarded 24 million pounds of that to seven large flagship interdisciplinary research programs, which Till very helpfully um, showcased a few of on her slides. Um, and they, they very much align with it with a couple of the goals that she referred to in terms of how we better understand the factors at play in adolescence 
how they interact to influence risk and resilience to mental health problems and how we can better translate that into um, strategies for prevention and early intervention. And, and just very much lastly, linked to that larger initiative, we'll be having a call later this year, an £8 million call that will be focused on accelerating progress in the field more broadly through better methods, through improved approaches to research. Um, and linked to some of the questions that have been emerging, um, there will definitely be an emphasis within that on how we improve methods associated with participatory research. Um, and just overall to end, I'm very happy to speak with any interested applicants um, who have um, potential proposals in this space. Great, thanks, Karen. And what do you think the challenges are? What are your three words for summarizing those? Summer? Yeah, I didn't really get three words. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't fit the brief, but I think definitely uh, connectivity and awareness of what, what's going on across the field, what already exists, where there's best practice, where you can tap into existing activities and, and, and resources and, and connecting all of that up so that you know researchers are, are, are better equipped to move forward and address these questions. And then also something around uh, the, the translation and really strengthening those different routes. There's not going to be one single route to, to impact from, from some of these questions and really strengthening that link up with the research landscape better. Great. Thank you very much. OK, uh, now we've got Kat Sebastian, uh, who's evidence lead for the mental health priority area at the Wellcome Trust. Over to you, Kat. Andre, um, so as some of you may know, the way mental health, health research is funded at Wellcome is in a period of transition. Um, luckily, with mental health becoming a larger priority for us, um, so it's now going to be one of three major health challenge areas that we think will be particular global challenges over the next 30 years or so. Um, so mental health is one of those challenge areas alongside infectious disease and the health effects of climate change. And in addition to those health challenge um, areas, which are more focused on prevention and intervention and translational research, researchers can also apply for more basic science projects, tackling mechanisms of relevance to mental health via our discovery research schemes. Um, so overall, it's, a, it's an exciting time for mental health at Wellcome, um, but we are in a period of um, transition. So, um, I can't tell you about any sort of um, current schemes, large schemes that are open, but I'll give you a flavor of what we've been doing and also what's to come in the next few months. Um, so as part of the mental health priority area, our focus has been on depression and anxiety in young people aged 14 to 24. And as part of the wider challenge area, we'll keep this focus, but likely expand to include um, other age groups and other aspects of mental health um, with our strategy still in development. Over the past 18 months or so, we've been conducting some foundational work on anxiety and depression in young people based around the concept of what we've termed active ingredients. Um, so we've conceptualized this as a focus on what factors and approaches are really making the difference in preventing or treating symptoms. Um, so it's nice to see the synergies with the first research question identified in the NIHR report. Um, what we did was we asked all our teams to conduct reviews of the evidence and to include input from young people with lived experience at every stage of the research process and to include lived experiences, um, experts as co-applicants where possible. Um, and we've just actually today released the names of our new research teams for our 2021 commission. Um, so do check out our website and Twitter for details of those. Um, so why, while our broader strategy for the mental health challenge area is still in development, um, broadly speaking, we hope to bridge the divide between the more basic discovery science and translational work, and to fund research that uses both a sort of more standard forward translation approach, but also to follow through with what our active ingredients research has um, indicated, which is that it's also fruitful to take a back translation approach and start with what works and then work back to why does it work and for whom. Um, so our plan is to release a larger primary research call, uh, most likely in early 2021. Um, so look out for announcements on that. Great, is that early 2022? Oh, sorry, 2022, honestly. Yeah, I'm doing that as well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, the three words. Um, 
So thinking about what we've heard um, today in the webinar, I think um, I would say a big challenge is inequality. Uh, that seems to have been a theme throughout the talks. Um, so both within the UK, so ensuring that mental health research is representative and reflects input from underrepresented groups, but also globally, um, and this is something that came out in our active ingredients work as well, that um, the vast majority of research into prevention and intervention in adolescents is um, in, takes place in high income countries. Um, so redressing that balance will be a big challenge. Um, second word, pandemic, um, echoing Catherine's thoughts from earlier. Um, there are still a lot of unknowns about what the effects on mental health will be, particularly in young people. Um, and thirdly, collaboration. And um, this is both a challenge and an opportunity. Um, so Till's talk alluded to the challenges, but also the strengths of building consensus across different groups. Um, and I think that's a, a great challenge for us as a funder to consider how can we encourage team science? How can we encourage the voice of lived experience uh, to be involved? Um, so I think hopefully a challenge, but hopefully a positive way to end as well. That's great, Kat. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Zoe McCrossan. Uh, who is the Senior Research Manager at NIHR Evaluation Trials and Studies Coordinating Centre. Over to you, Zoe. Hi, thanks for introducing me. So um, my name is Zoe Crossan. I'm Senior Research Manager at NHR. Um, we manage um, four of the NHR research programmes here, three of which I think are most relevant to the research questions that have been shared with us today. Uh, all programmes um, support proactive commissioning of work. Um, through close working with various stakeholders and to identify gaps for further research. And all of them also work in a researcher led mode and where applicants can apply at any time to one of our open rolling calls. Each programme has three drawdowns a year um, and we fund both primary and secondary research. Um, we have a public mental health, public health programme that funds non NHS evaluations of practical interventions such as evaluations of health and mental well-being, parenting programmes, and with general focus on prevention at the population level. We currently have calls live on mental health and well-being in young women, food insecurity and gambling that reference impact on child and young people's mental health. Um, we have future calls on outdoor play for children and young people and to support mental health, um, tackling violence against women and girls, suicide prevention and unstable housing coming up over the next few months. Um, we have a health services and delivery program that funds evaluation of the NHS-based services, so models of care, access to PAMs, child to adult care transition, social care interventions. We recently worked with the uh, work, What Work Centre for Children's Social Care on um, a, child, a children and young person's mental health um, call. Um, and although it's recently closed, um, we continue to welcome applications in this area anytime through researcher led. So even though the course closed, people are getting into contact with us if you're interested in applying. Um, we also have a health technology assessment program, and this funds evaluations of clinical and cost effectiveness of screening, treatments, psychological therapies. Um, and HTA recently just published a large review of systematic reviews and showing the effectiveness of CBT. Uh, for a variety of different conditions and populations, and this was funded from this year. Um, and then actually also funded quite recently a number of um, COVID specific projects as well. We've discussed here the implications of the lockdown, um, and we have some around sort of um, the impact of COVID um, on mental health and secondary school sec uh, children, um, and also um, CAM services to provide remote treatment for um, children with anxiety in the COVID 19 context as well. Um, so there are a variety of different ongoing pieces of tools and work that people can apply to. Um, there's more information uh, about the remit of our programmes on the NHL website. Um, and since we fund evaluations of interventions that cover the entire applied health pathway, we can usually find a suitable programme for any of the research questions. And I'm, I'm particularly looking at the list of questions um, that we've provided today, and I could see that many of these questions would fall within, the most of them would be fall within the remit um, for NHR. Um, and um, you can also contact us via email. And the other thing that's important is because we have a commissioned work stream, we're interesting for people who are uh, making research suggestions at any time. So topics or calls for research that are interesting. 
Um, and these can also be submitted. So even if you don't have an existing research application, but you have a really good idea of what needs to be researched, then you can also submit these research suggestions to NHR and we can consider them for our commissioned work stream. And I know you asked for three um, different things that I had, unfortunately I'm on a similar sort of uh, stream to Catherine. I had um, prevention as my primary one, because I think that um, we need to do a great deal more on prevention. Um, I support the public health programme and we are, you could see by the variety of things that we're doing, we're trying to take that tackle to the prevention level to prevent requirement for treatment, ongoing treatment and further down the line. Um, I also had inequalities. Um, so that's not just, accessibility to um, treatment and services and to research, um, but also to address the balance that is at risk groups or the, or the regional uh, variation we have in access to services or regional variation, or the other variation in risk that children have as well um, across the country, um, depending on where they live. Um, and also I had collaboration because I think this is going to be a, a collaborative effort between funders and service users and researchers um, in order to make sure that we, we answer the right questions um, that, that's from me that's great thank you Zoe it's good that we're getting some repetition already so we're clearly uh, working along the right lines and the same lines um, okay so next up is uh, Sarah Chanel from MQ she's the head of research at the MQ mental health charity over to you Sarah thanks Andre uh, it's great to be here and part of this um, I, I was thinking back to when it first began, way, way back when, and um, our excitement to, in the office at being involved in this, um, in the original JLA exercise. Um, so MQ and the questions, I guess, um, as, as like with uh, many of the other organisations, we fairly recently launched a new strategic framework. Um, and as uh, the, the, the summit, the science summit meeting that Ian mentioned was um, right in the middle of when we had a, a flagship program that was entirely focused on children and young people, the Brighter Futures program. Um, what we've noticed is that actually pretty much everything related to mental health and mental health research actually really needs to involve children and young people in an early years approach. And so we've taken um, a view that instead of having a, a bespoke specific program for children and young people's mental health research actually it should run through everything we do and be an, uh, an undercutting theme I don't mean undercutting do I <laughs> underpinning theme um, and so that's that's reflected um, so our current uh, strategic progress pr dear I can't get my words actually strategic priority this year is thriving in a post-pandemic world um, and so we've been involved in a, in a variety of different um, related projects some of which are more policy related um, uh, we, we announced three fellows awards at the start of the year that focused on children and young people's mental health um, uh, including a focus on, on some COVID work um, and then as part of this post-pandemic world um, work we've been involved with a, an APPG report um, that's got some quite uh, very specific policy recommendations that um, it's fascinating to see the synergy between the recommendations in our APPG report and the questions that come out came out of this. Um, moving into uh, next year, we're going to be focusing more on um, our new Gone Too Soon programme, which is about the, the scandal of excess deaths due to both suicidality and um, co-occurring physical health problems that are undetected, um, more likely, um, but undetected and, and untreated. Um, and so we're in the process of beginning scoping up um, an expert meeting that will be quite quite relatively small and um, 40 or so people quite carefully put together to ensure that it leads to some quite tight recommendations, um, both for research and, um, and more generally, but specifically research. So that will happen um, early next year. And following that, we'll, there'll be another Fellows Award um, later on in the year. So in, in terms of, of these questions and the Gone Too Soon programme, I think there's a, um, again, a really, it's almost like two axes, two, two different axes in that the, the outcomes um, or the topics of the Gone Too Soon programme are about suicidal behaviour and thinking and about uh, early physical um, or 
in terms of young people, early instances and manifestations and risk factors for later physical health problems. So with that, with those kind of outcomes in mind, pretty much any of the top 10 questions are, are, in, are important to look at within that. So there's definitely scope for um, applications to the Fellows Award. The other thing that I think that MK is involved with that's really relevant to this um, is about data. So I'm going to slightly sneak ahead to one of my three words, which is data. Um, and, and as you'll probably be aware, that the, what happens usually with research projects is that data stays in, in the place in which it was conducted. And of course, the open science movement and team science approaches have led to a real call for that to change and for data and um, metadata about research data to be made more available. Um, MQs on the leadership of DataMind, which is funded by MRC and is an HDI UK health data research hub, lots of acronyms, um, which is about making data from different research projects um, discoverable and visible to other researchers, but also interoperable, by which we mean that the same item, maybe depression, measured in two different ways in two different research projects can be investigated at the same time in a, in a subsequent study. And so any and all of the research projects relating to the um, to the top 10 questions um, have an open invitation <laughs> to be to part of DataMind. Um, and in the, the three year period of the DataMind grant from MIC, MRC, the majority of the costs for, get, for making the data discoverable and interoperable are met within the grant. Um, subsequently, the cost model will change. <laughs> so uh, researchers or research funders will need to pay, pay for, them, for that themselves. But um, certainly for now, there's a real opportunity to enable research data to be that happens in one place fun, funded by one funder to be discoverable more generally um, and we're working with Louise Arsenault she's also on the leadership team with the um, catalog of measures um, that will be a similar approach to that and then also to be able to be um, analyzed simultaneously so I think that's that's a that will be a game changer for children and young people's mental health research because um, although the majority of mental health research problems begin early on actually the numbers and particularly in early years, the numbers are not huge. And so actually the more that we can do to, um, to get better data and larger, larger sample sizes, the more accurate our data will be and, the, and the, the more rapidly we can bring change. So one of my three words is data. Another one, it, there's a theme definitely between the panelists without any prior communication. Um, I thought about collaboration, but I actually opted for coordination um, because I think with the variety, of, particularly with something like the mental health research goals, we can all agree that they're all good ideas, but if we all try and go after all of them at the same time, there'll be enormous duplication of effort and potentially not much progress. And what's perhaps is arguably more valuable is a level of um, understanding what's happening in the sector to be able to coordinate who's doing what, um, to make space for some people to shine, to be clear on what's attributable to which organisation, um, and to avoid some of the duplication that's previously hampered much of the research world. Um, and then my third word was equity. And I thought about equality, and I ended up opting for equity. But very, very similar theme, I think you'll agree. Thanks, Sarah. No, important difference. Um, that's great. And so we've got two more speakers left. Uh, first of all, Vanessa Pinfold, who is speaking as a trustee of Mental Health Research UK today. Uh, of course, Vanessa is also co-founder and research director at the McPin Foundation. Over to you, Vanessa. Thanks, um, Andre. Um, and I'm also the chair of the Alliance of Mental Health Research Funders. Um, and that's as, as, as an alliance of um, some charities within the sector. And we had our meeting this morning, actually. And, it, it did really emphasize the importance of charities and the place of charities as co-funders. Um, so one of the things, if, if you're small, linking in with NIHR, such as Autistica have done, or NSPCC have linked with ESRC. So in terms of the funder landscape, I think that charities are really keen to fund, but they often don't have masses of resource and therefore they're all looking for partnership working. So that's an important thing, a kind of cross across funders. The other thing is to say that, yes, I'm a trustee of Mental Health Research UK. Um, and we have funded eight PhDs in the last two um, in the last two years, and four of those were around children and young people's mental health research. So, as researchers, if you're thinking about um, um, applying for a PhD, um, Mental Health Research UK may be able to help, 
Um, we have a funding round that launches in February each year. Um, and what's important is that you link up with the university because the university is the funder. Um, you put your project into us and then they select you to do the, to do the work. But again, Mental Health Research UK has been around for a number of years and we're really focused on capacity building. So we see that our role, our small role within the mental health funding um, programme is to really bring bright talent forward. Um, and to really invest um, in, in making sure that we've got, um, you know, people doing mental health research. And as I say, children and young people is one of the themes in which we really do prioritise. The other thing I wanted to say is that I think that um, you wouldn't be surprised to know that both with my hat of Mental Health Research UK, but also of the Alliance and, and um, at PIN is lived experience leadership is really, really important. So increasingly thinking about in my role in Mental Health Research UK, how to bring in lived experience leadership across the charity into various different um, decision making mechanisms. And I think that goes to the sharing of power that Till was talking about and being comfortable doing that. And I think one of the really interesting things about the James Lind Alliance Priority Setting Partnership that we did is that it was a joint idea of Tom and mine several years ago, but then I completely stepped out of it. And Tom and the team and the Children and Young People's panel ran that entire programme. And I think as a leader, we have to do more of that. So we can start, start things off and then we can step right out of, of, of the circle, as it were, stay interested, um, but also, you know, yeah, delegate responsibility. And I think for me, that was a really, really important part of the journey of MUPIN. Um, and I'm so super proud of Catherine and Tom today talking about that work. Um, and, and that for everybody here to be thinking about, you know, children and young people's mental health as a parent, it's so pa I'm so passionate about this because it, it's so important. Um, and there are so many challenges that we've got with COVID um, uh, and there were so many challenges before COVID, but we've definitely got a lot of challenges now. And therefore talking about this is very, very important and putting our energy into funding children, young people's mental health research so that we can actually implement a change in practice. So if we come to my three words, I would say co-researchers, we need co-researchers in research. I mean, young people. So co-researchers, young people, lived experience, train them, support them, help them to become the leaders of the future. Implement, implement research. The evidence gap is a massive. We need to implement all this amazing research that we do. And the last thing I would say is intersectionality. We have to look at the intersections here, whether it's in data mining or whether it's in a qualitative research study. Unless we understand the intersectionality between people's experiences, we're not going to build the, the relevant evidence base to actually make changes in practice. So through the Alliance, through MUPIN, through Mental Health Research UK, um, we'll be trying to do that. Fabulous. Thank you, Vanessa. That's great. Uh, and finally, we've got Ian again, who's talking now uh, in specifically with his uh, CCF hat on. Is that right, Ian? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So the, the other research, pro the other research programs that uh, Zoe didn't talk about. Uh, uh, so, uh, so this is again primarily NIHR. Uh, funding. It's worth just saying that um, uh, one thing right up at the top, it hasn't been publicised yet, but that will happen in the next week. And I'm allowed to tell you that the NIHR is about to, uh, is, is, in, is investing another 30 million over the next two and a half years in mental health research, uh, of which the first uh, example has already been mentioned, the RFPV call that was uh, mental health in the north. Uh, um, and there's a new I for I call coming up uh, on children, and young people's mental digital technologies for children, and young people's mental health, which um, the scope for that should be on the website within the next few days. Uh, we have a webinar um, that's going uh, next week. Um, actually, Alice, if you've got the link to that event, like, could you post that? There's a, you can sign up for the webinar next week to find out what the call is all about. But it's about digital health technologies. Uh, it's, the, it's running alongside our Connect, I for I Connect call from the middle of August through to the middle of September um, and uh, 100, up to £150,000 uh, for uh, up to 12 months of research. It will take, uh, you have to sign up pretty quickly and get contracted because we need to spend some of that money this year. Um, the, we're, we're beholden to the Treasury for some of that. Um, there are um, other things happening as well. Um, uh, Program development grants. It, there's a program development grant award open. Similarly, 150,000 six to 12 months, uh, and there will that will be followed up uh, in, by another another call later in the year. Um, and the RFPB uh, call uh, will continue. So the, the the overarching theme of this, as you've probably heard already, uh, is relating to uh, where there's an overburdened population who are under who are under involved in research where research is not being done. So we're trying to map that and, we, and our scope for these calls will have that 
uh, mapping as part of the scope so you'll see where the research is and where the burden is and where the gaps are so we're trying to encourage and, and, and in fact it will be a requirement for for the applicants to address that that gap uh, in funding um it's worth saying as uh, zoe pointed out that all of our normal uh calls where, which are research are led largely from um the ccf are open to um uh, any any calls that would fit in any any and you just have to justify and uh, uh the unmet need which is which is fairly straightforward i think in this case um it's worth saying i'm going to step outside uh, well so i'll stay with that nihr very briefly to say uh in response to one thing that vanessa pointed out uh, the nihr is very open to co-funding with charities we have some clear models of where, through which that can be done and we're starting to see that happening in other areas haven't seen it in mental health yet uh, most recently, I for I did some stuff with technology in um, uh, asthma with Asthma UK. Uh, we're also uh, we've also got some examples with Versus Arthritis and uh, other charities already, and we have some uh, some steps, some ways of operating now, which which make hopefully will make that easier. If anyone's interested in that conversation, come and talk to us. We we can we can uh, we can work with you on that. Um, I also wanted to highlight. Uh, one call which is not in IHR, but SBRI Healthcare have just announced that we're going. They're, they're running a pilot scheme uh, for late stage products for uh, around ch uh, children, and young people's mental health to uh, to accelerate that development. So doing real world evaluation for late stage products of uh, probably mo most certainly digital, I would think. Uh, uh, to actually accelerate their progress into to being adopted by the NHS. Uh, the scope for that isn't up there, but if you look at the SBRI healthcare website, uh, that has been announced and within the next few days, there should be a scope document. Uh, it's just waiting for sign off by the NHS before that call goes out. Oh, my three words. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, I've probably got two, two of the same. I, I've got... Um, uh the i think uh, coordination I've, I've decided to change it to coordination i, was, I, I had avoiding duplication i was concerned about the number of things that might be happening so I, I think i'll go with sarah's coordination as a word um i want to put in education here because um my my wife happens to be a, a special needs coordinator so she has a lot she deals with a lot of children in her primary school uh that have needs and is very very aware of the lack of the ability to get anything have to happen for them in terms of treatment um, and, uh, and, and and clearly we need to involve uh, educationalists in this research uh, and indeed in the practice of it. And, and it's that's an interesting question. It's quite difficult. I've had lots of conversations with her about how to do that. She's got lots of opinions, but not a lot of time. And that's a challenge. Um, and the other uh, the other word, I think, uh, is um, well, I think I'm going to go back to uh, uh, I'm going to say collaboration, because I think uh, that's one of the things we want to encourage. Uh, in responding to these questions uh, is collaboration and I'll come I'll say a little bit more about that in the next steps uh, shortly. Great thank you Ian. So we've got a bit of a free-for-all now with the panel. Um, I'm not going to direct questions to specific people I'm just going to let you jump in. I know you've all got loads to say so I'm sure no one will hog the microphone so just stick your hand up if I say something that is of interest to you and jump in. Um, I wanted to start with this question about co-production you know, the banner that we've had up for the last couple of years is, is co-production, not faux production in mental health research. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to share how you're doing that. How are you ensuring that the research that you fund is involving young people from a diverse range of groups with lived experience? Who wants to come in on that? Kat? I'm happy to start on that, although um, our lived experience lead um, in our team, Kate Martin would be much better placed, but I'll try to do her work justice. Um, so we've been trying to think about um, not just how to encourage research teams to include the voice of lived experience, but how to um, incorporate it into the way we design our funding calls and the way that we review the funding that's come in. Um, so this has been a, a new way of working for me. Um, what Kate has done in the last... Um, year or so is um, recruit a, a global network of um, youth advisors who act as consultants to the work that our team do. Um, so just to give an example of our recent Active Ingredients Commission, um, we had a team of young advisors who were involved in um, every stage right from uh, 
thinking about what should be the research priorities that we put in our request for proposals, um, then involved in helping us to um, select expressions of interest, which ones go through to each stage, um, trying to um, trying to get at some sort of parity between the expertise that the academic reviewers bring, but also the expertise that the lived experience advisors bring. Um, and I think their input has been reflected in the 21 teams that we've selected. Um, certainly there were priorities which I don't think we would have necessarily set. Um, so for example, looking at the role of agency, looking at the role of um, reducing discrimination, um, things that um, are sort of perhaps outside what we as a sort of biomedical research charity would typically have thought, but actually it's made for a much more rounded commission. Um, and then we've encouraged, well, actually we've mandated that every research team must include um, advisors with lived experience in the creation of their reviews. Um, so yes, it's um, been a new way of working and, you know, in some ways it does um, kind of take longer to bring together everyone's views, make sure that we're taking people's views into account, constantly have communication um, to ensure that their feedback is taken on board. Um, but I think it has made for a much better, more rounded um, commission. And, and we hope that this can be a model that we can use moving forward as we embark on the new aspects of our strategy. Yeah, Karen, do you want to come in? Yeah, yeah, I think we've been on a, a similar journey ourselves in terms of our, our recent um, initiatives and our recent calls. And we've been really lucky enough to have a number of really great young people involved. And, and a few of those have been involved in the McFinn work as well. And, and in terms of, you know, in our own funding process, yes, we, we've learned a lot and we've, we've um, there's probably things we do differently next time. And I think we're continuing to learn. But in terms of how we support the researchers, we were... We did some high, you know, I'm, I'm glad we had a two stage call because I would say in terms of that, that outline stage to full proposal, we, we worked, provided a lot of feedback and we brought one of those young people who'd been involved in the outline stage. She gave a great talk to the shortlisted applicants and made them really think about what, what co-production really looks like, what are we really expecting here? And it became such a strong emphasis within the call that, that it was really examined quite carefully, um, and, and especially the, the final interviews as well. Um, but related to that, what we're doing within the programme and in collaboration with Welcome is we're looking at um, this space more generally and how we can support researchers better. What are the resources out there? How we can um, provide a bit of a platform that, that makes it more accessible to, to understand how they approach this and how, how they do it, how they do it well. And Vanessa is involved in that work as well. So it's, it's something that continues to be on our agenda and, and what we want to um, help the community um, be more equipped. To, to do better. Thank you. I want to pick up on this point about inequality and inequity and ask for some um, positive examples of collaboration. Um, because we know that the, the people who face the starkest inequities are people from you know, these communities that we've referred to a few times, people with learning disabilities, young people that identify as LGBTQ+, racialized communities. Um, Give us some examples of research that you're funding that's, that's bringing together these diverse groups um, to actually work on some of these problems. I can mention one. Um, so, I, I mean, it's such an important topic and it's one I'm aware of um, my own position in. So I, I take a listening perspective in the main um, to this. Um, but one project that MQ has been involved with for quite a long time is the adolescent data platform in Swansea that Anne John leads. Um, and one of the, the things that Anne has said repeatedly to us and more broadly is that um, routine collect, routinely collected data gives a voice to people who are not 
um, who are underrepresented in conventional research projects. And I think what she means by that is that there's an immediate bias. As soon as you do sensible research ethics, that of course is important, you immediately have a biased sample who are overeducated. There's something about the process of consenting for research that immediately biases the participant group you end up with. Um, and while I don't think for a minute she's, ad she's advocating doing away with um, sensible ethics uh, processes, what she's saying is that the information about these people's mental health is um, is available in in routinely collected data and as long as that data is um, is approached ethically and is accessed in a way that is safe and is private and trustworthy actually there are some really important um, ex important insights to be gained um, and and um, even in some cases experimental research that can be done within um, routinely collected data to find out what what's going on to characterize some of the risks but also to consider what helps and what solutions make a difference and what solutions are particularly appropriate for which groups um so i know she's got a project and um it's one project in particular at the moment that's looking at uh, traveler communities which are almost impossible to to find um research studies on um so that that's one i'm aware of but um others may have more Got an example from our um, from Active Ingredients again. In the first commission, we did have applications from low and middle income countries, but we didn't specifically um, try to to target those geographies. Whereas in the second commission, we actually set a target of at least twenty five percent of our teams um, should be based in low and middle income countries. And I think just by having that target, it encouraged a larger proportion of applications from those regions, and we ended up funding a third of um, teams with um, leads based in low and middle income countries. Um, so it was a, it illustrated to us the strengths of going for a sort of target based approach. Um, and another thing that we've done is also to ask um, reviewers explicitly um, when they're looking at the research data to look at whether there is research data coming from low and middle income countries. And if not to, explicitly you know raise that as a, a research gap to raise awareness thanks Kat. that's great i knew we would run out of time um there's loads of other stuff i'd love to talk about with you guys and it would be great to have more opportunity to have these sorts of discussions i think it's really nice that we brought together such a uh, a brilliant bunch of people for this conversation we're going to wind it up now and we're going to ask ian and catherine to um, to provide some final thoughts um, and to talk about next steps. So Ian, would you like to start? Yes, sure. Um, it, it's uh, it's worth saying that um, uh, there's a, uh, Paris has just shared a link in the, the um, uh, Centre for um, Engagement and Dissemination at NIHR have just published, a, recently published a review uh, on uh, children and young people's mental health, which is on the website. And there's a link that just, that she's just, uh, Paris has just published published in the chat. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a few things briefly as we come to an end um, around uh, what we want to do next. Um, so what are we going to what's going to happen next? First thing we're going to do is we are going to write up write this all up as a peer reviewed publication. Um, I've actually had a, a, as soon as we can, it's a question of fine. As you know, writing papers is it's not particularly for us. It's not necessarily a crucial, but for researchers, it clearly is. And lots of you have been involved in this process. So those who were involved in survey two already know that their names will be on that paper. Um, I, I have had one volunteer to help me with the writing. So if anybody else would like to volunteer to uh, to help me in some way, even if it's just to read uh, and comment on the draft that would be really helpful uh, thank you very much um, uh, you've heard from the funders about all the opportunities that there are out there uh, so come back to each one of us uh, with 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 uh, your your um, requests or questions or comments and, and indeed applications um, we'd like to ask you and I think we're going to do a quick poll in a moment is is to follow up this because one of the things we wanted to try and do was to actually in, to encourage that collaboration uh, perhaps to avoid some duplication um, is to and and uh, definitely to bring multiple different pieces of people groups of researchers together. Would you value uh, the opportunity for some a sort of sandpit kind of writing event uh, to happen? Because we, we were thinking about potentially doing such an event in perhaps in September to follow up this uh, release of the questions. So if you'd like to do that, uh, Alice, can you 
push the poll out and then we'll just get an, an, a, a, an answer about whether or not uh, you would like to be involved in, in, in an event like that. So, ah, brilliant. Um, and the second question was about industry, exposure to industry. So I think the answer is yes and yes to those. So we will uh, follow up uh, this event in that case with uh, uh, with uh, something to uh, to help in those in those so, so watch out for that. I haven't um, actually managed to arrange a date yet. I'm looking at September and thinking how horrible the calendar looks looks with all sorts of things. But we'll we'll definitely try and fit something in uh, as soon as we can uh, to to help uh, with both of those. Brilliant. Um, and uh, we obviously, as part of this uh, expectation, is we want to try and monitor what happens. And we, as as we've already heard about understanding what the impact of this is, the real impact, uh, not just about getting some research papers out, but actually the impact of the, eventually this will have. Um, and uh, it's not always as easy as we'd like it to be. That's one of the reasons we want to publish it so that you can reference the publication and make that link much more easy to follow. Um, uh, if you do apply or if when you publish the results, if you want to tell us about it, that would be even better because that will make our life much more e much easier. Uh, so please, please do that. And, and indeed, if it's I'm sure uh, we we anything that's funded related to the McPin questions, we'll be we will be feeding that back to McPin. And I'm sure they'll be very pleased to to hear about that as well. Uh, and the other thing to say, finally, uh, it, before I hand over to Catherine for some final words, is just to say thank you very much to all of those who've been involved. The. Um, 50 odd people that proposed questions in the first place, 60 odd people that proposed questions in the first place, and the 44 especially that were in some cases a fair bit of pressure was leaned on the last few uh, to get our statistics correct for the for the methodology, but to actually uh, to go through those 87 questions and score them against five criteria was not a not a quick uh, uh, activity, and we're very very thankful for you to do that, and and hopefully um, this will lead to some some really good research that comes out of this. So um, at, the, at that point, I'm going to hand over to Catherine to uh, to uh, give us some final thoughts. Uh, yes. Yeah, so just to like sum up um, what everyone has said today, um, I think it's very important that. Um, in order for us to be able to answer the most important questions that um, funding is given to research at the most, sorry, in order to answer the most important questions, it's important to involve young people at the earliest stage. As everyone knows, prevention is better than cure. And so obviously, you know, in terms of like involving people from diverse backgrounds, also including men, because men tend to be um, ones who don't aren't really involved in these type of research groups um when it has to do with mental health it's mainly women or like people from um different like low social economic backgrounds and people from different cultures etc all of that is very important so i hope you've taken it all in and like thank you so much for listening Wonderful. Thank you, Catherine. And thanks, Ian. Um, we're going to draw to a close now. We've managed to um, cover quite a bit, I think. We're going to share with you, um, everyone who's registered for the event and joined us today, the slides, the videos of the talks, the links from the chat, and also the details for this follow-up event that Ian's been talking about that will happen uh, in September. And so you'll be able to sign up for that. Um, and yes, thanks very much to all of our speakers and our panelists and for everyone who joined the webinar today.